epigenetics. It's a subject only for the brave, or those with an intense agenda, perhaps. We have to be a little careful, because it's still an emerging field, is epigenetics, and studies have included low volumes of examples, high statistical numbers are necessary for safe conclusions. Well, there's my disclaimer. Inherited conditions not caused by mutations to the genetic code DNA. Epigenetics is a more obscure type of inheritance. How events in someone's lifetime can change the way their actual DNA makeup is expressed and how that change can be passed on to the next generation. The process of epigenetics where the readability or expression of genes is modified without changing the DNA code itself, tiny chemical tags are added to or removed from our DNA in response to changes in the environment in which we're living. These tags turn genes on and off, offering a way of adapting to changing conditions without inflicting a more permanent shift in our genomes. I'll give you plenty of examples, but if this epigenetic changes acquired during life can indeed also be passed on to later generations. The implications are huge. Your experiences during your lifetime, particularly traumatic ones, would have a very real impact on your family for generations to come. Yes, experiences during your lifetime have a very real impact on your family for generations to come. There are a growing number of studies that support the idea that the effects of trauma can reverberate down generations through this epigenetics process. An 11% higher mortality rate in the sons of American Civil War prisoners of war or Holocaust survivors due to cerebral haemorrhage or cancer happened in the sons of the males that experienced the trauma but not the daughters. The unusual sex-linked pattern was the reason health differences might be suspected to be epigenetic. If you look at families, there are only effects among sons born after, but not before the war. Or the trauma. It could have been that there's a genetic trait within their father enabling them to survive the starvation tendency towards obesity that then goes bad during normal times. But then the children before and after the trauma would be equally likely to show the reduced life expectancy, the genetic cause being ruled out. The Y chromosome, because the male system is a little less vulnerable than the female system to survive trauma. Reproductive system. The woman plays the greater part. The epigenetic effect is consistent with studies in remote Swedish villages where shortages in food supply and a generational effect down the male line, but not the female line. But what if this increased risk of death was due to a legacy of the father's trauma that had nothing to do with DNA? What if traumatised fathers were more likely to abuse their children, leading to long-term health consequences and sons bore the brunt of it more than daughters? Children from before the trauma didn't have the spike in mortality statistically. The sons after the trauma did. The darkest moments of human history, famines and genocides, leave the clearest epigenetic marks on the descendants of those who suffered them. A hormone involved in the stress response, cortisol, a gene linked to cortisol levels, survivors of the Holocaust. Children had epigenetic effects, changes. But this has not been carried through as a study through several generations. The scent of smell seems to play a part in generational studies of mice, conditioned cherry blossom. They become more jumpy and nervous than pup mice whose Fathers hadn't been conditioned to fear the smell of cherry blossom. By zapping the mice's foot with electric current, this happened even when the descendants were raised by unrelated mice who never smelt cherry blossom. It wasn't learned behaviour. Grand pup mice also showed this heightened sensitivity, but not to other smells. Epigenetic modifications in the sperm DNA Chemical markers on their DNA were found on a gene encoding a small receptor expressed in the olfactory bulb between the nose and the brain, which is involved in sensing the cherry blossom scent. The dissected brains were found 
to have a greater number of neurons that detect the scent. It's not fear that's passed on down the generations, but sensitivity. The consequences of passing down the effects of trauma are huge, even if slightly subtly altered between generations. It would change the way we view how our lives in the context of our parents' experience, how we are influencing our physiology and even our mental health. And then there's knowing that the consequences of our own actions and experiences now could affect the lives of our children even long before they might be conceived, could be put a very different spin on how we choose to live. But it might be quite rare. The vast majority of one type of epigenetic mark on the DNA, the addition of a clump of chemicals known as methylation, is wiped clean at the very start of life and the process of adding these chemical groups to the DNA begins almost from scratch. As soon as the sperm enters the egg in a mammal, there's a rapid loss of DNA methylation from the paternal set of chromosomes. Though transgenerational epigenetic inheritance is a surprise. Genomic imprinting protects the methylation of specific points of the genome, but these sites are not the ones where the epigenetic changes relevant to trauma are found. It's the RNA molecules similar to DNA that are altering how genes function. Again, RNA plays a role in how the effects of trauma can be inherited. Trauma early in life could be passed on by taking mouse pups away from their mothers right after birth. It's to mimic dislocated families or the abuse, neglect and emotional damage that you sometimes see in people. If a Jewish family elects, as they have to, to have their eight-day-old children circumcised and fall bepe. If Palestinian children are born into a household where Jewish settlers descend from a hilltop and harass them with violence every night until they vacate their properties and they are seized. Children who have experienced early trauma and the mice showed signs of increased risk-taking and higher calorie intake, both seen in child trauma survivors. When the males grew up, they had pups that showed similar traits, overeating, risk-taking and higher levels of antisocial behaviour. No. If you extract the RNA molecules from the sperm of male mice who had been traumatised and injected these molecules into the early embryos of mice whose parents had not experienced this early life trauma, the offspring, the pups, showed the typical altered behavioural patterns of a pup whose parents experienced trauma. Different lengths of RNA molecules are linked to different behavioural patterns. Longer RNA correspond to greater food intake, change the body's response to insulin and greater risk-taking. Smaller RNA molecules are linked to showing signs of despair. A clear causal link. Is there an amnesty international for mice? Every little sperm is sacred after all, but it's much easier to study sperm than study eggs. Histone is the protein that acts as the scaffold for DNA. This can be chemically tagged and modified. But expect more about this epigenetics, because post-traumatic stress disorder was equally a controversial diagnosis. Not everyone believed there could be a long-term effect of trauma. But new associations can be formed. The mice, remember them? They were desensitised to the smell. They weren't given an electric shock when they smelled cherry blossom and they did lose the fearful genetic signature. And their offspring too. If you unlearn the trauma of your parents, you need not pass it on to your children. This is a cognitive behavioural therapy thing. Like, it didn't exist. Epigenetics is malleable, but it is tending towards eugenics. Eugenics pretty much arose during the 1800s, and then by the 1930s and 40s, Hitler had put it to famous effect. Unless your religion manifests trauma for centuries, the die is not cast. For the most part, we are not messing up the human race, even though trauma abounds in our environment. Healing the effects of trauma in our lifetime can put a stop to... It echoing further down the generations. Stop the circumcision of eight-day-old babies. Stop 
the bepe sucking of the blood from the baby boy's penis, you will still go to your Jewish heaven if you don't follow these horrific Neanderthal doctrines. Toxins, stress, socio-economic status, bullying, racism and the lifestyles of our parents and grandparents can all turn on and off certain genomes in our DNA. How can we have a more liberal and egalitarian society? Improving the function of everyone's epigenomes with the right environment. Exploitation, destruction, epidemic and trauma in Afro-Americans. Has a biological trace been left in the genes which can be transmitted to future generations? You can start to see how the likes of Trump could make this problematic. Even in the 1920s, it was argued that certain populations had been exposed to various pathogenic environments like alcoholism, poverty, promiscuity and a hot climate for too long, becoming irreparably damaged. Their offspring too had to be treated with special care as it was believed that the damage was likely to be transmitted across generations. This played into the hands of eugenicists. People with these undesirable traits should be stopped from reproducing. Prohibiting marriages, supporting forced sterilizations. Those seen as unfit to pass on their genes. People with mental or physical disabilities. This persisted even into the 1970s. But Nazi Germany had learnt a lot through American eugenicists. In 1910, an English Jewish physician was writing about racial poison. Genetics put aside the idea of hereditary could be poisoned by environmental factors. Pretty much, eugenics pretty much disappeared from Western policy debates. But it is resurfacing. Folate deficiency, poisoned inheritance, 2013. Low birth weights in African Americans compared to European Americans. This is put down to the long-term effects of 19th century slavery. Low birth weight leads to higher mortality in infancy and long-term negative health consequences. Epigenetic speculation, really. There could be a large number of different interpretations. Racist groups trying to argue for the acquired inferiority of specific populations. Glasgow in Britain. DNA methylation, a biochemical process that controls how genes work. Lower methylation has been related to the risk of developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease linked to the stressful conditions experienced by expectant mothers in poor areas. The cards of life dealt just weeks after conception when methylation takes place in the embryo. Babies born into poverty are damaged forever before birth. These have been newspaper headlines, which could be used to call for regeneration and support, but just as likely degeneration and poisoning. We are now educated about the dangers of eugenics, but do people listen when they've got a distinct agenda? It's just another tool to hijack. Can we advance social justice? But science doesn't create an inclusive society. Social values often decide how we implement science, rather than science implicating social values. What implications does this have for the curriculum, the classroom, the school, crime and punishment? Banding, viability, or inclusivity, putting the naughty children in with the more gifted to give them exemplars? What new David Koresh Waco-like new religions might arise and plan new typologies of a person? What would it mean for military training? Narcissism is at least partly genetic. Generations of the same family in the same trade in the same university degree. Families will engineer that narcissistic golden child. <laughs>